Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Tech Trend series from CISA. Uh, and before we get started, I just wanted to um, say thank you to our sponsors and supporters. So our platinum supporters, Arup, Diatech, Procad, and Celebri, our gold sponsors, Linesight and 5D, and uh, this is also supported by CISA and SkillsNet. The agenda, uh, the um, attendees for today, or the presenters for today, are myself, Emma Hayes, I'm Managing Director of Digital Build Consultants. I will be chairing the session today. And then we are very lucky to have Dan O'Gorman from Fex Fexon, uh, Monica Malacic from DCT Group, and Jonathan Reinhardt from Diatech to share their experiences and uh, uh, knowledge with us this afternoon. The agenda for today um, is going to uh, start with a little bit of a, an opening address from myself. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to Dan O'Gorman uh, and followed by uh, Monica and Jonathan. And then we'll have a Q&A at the end. So uh, if you can hold off on your questions until the very end, but do please um, type your questions in the chat um, as you think of them. Um, and we'll, we'll certainly go through them at the end. So, as I said, welcome again to the Technology Tech Trend Series. Um, today, we're going to talk about it's time to shift to BIM. Um, and I suppose from my perspective, um, I've been implementing BIM and digital construction processes for over 12 years. Um, and back in 2010, when I was first introduced to building information modeling, I thought it was going to make such a major improvement to how we planned, executed, and uh, uh, delivered our construction projects. And it was such a major game changer to the industry. I thought we'd all be jumping at the opportunity to work smarter, not harder. And yet here we are 12 years later, and we're asking the question or saying, um, it's time to shift to BIM. So I suppose, why is the industry, in particular SMEs, um, been quite slow to adopt building information modeling and digital construction processes. Um, a survey by Enterprise Ireland a few years ago revealed that the barriers to BIM adoption were a lack of client interest, insufficient training, unavailability of standardized tools and protocols, and issues related to data ownership. But we now have a lot of those barriers resolved. So we, we now have uh, international information management standards, ISO 19650. There's extensive training courses and programs to support the adoption of BIM within the construction industry. But is it that there's still a lack of client interest that's stopping this um, uh, full adoption of BIM and digital construction processes? Um, and if it is that it's a lack of client interest, how can we encourage client interest to help the construction industry fully adopt BIM and digital construction? Um, will a government mandate help and help drive the adoption um, through to the SMEs? Um, and how will those SMEs be supported with their digital transition? Um, and I suppose the good news is we now have ISO 19650, as I said, we also have training um, and there is also support there for SMEs to um, uh, transition to digital construction uh, and BIM processes. Uh, and uh, the exciting thing is that the National Development Plan for 2021 to 2040 has um, noted that the government will, will commence the implementation of BIM uh, for major projects. So that means there is a mandate coming down the, the tracks. And even more exciting is, um, uh, particularly on this day, uh, Minister Michael McGrath um, uh, uh, launched the Build Digital Project, which is a really exciting uh, project that is going to help transform the Irish construction and built environment sectors. Um, it's going to enable all the stakeholders, and in particular SMEs, um, to um, develop, maintain, and continuously improve their capabilities um, so that they're digitally enabled um, and able to participate in uh, digital construction and BIM processes on projects. And that's 
to, to meet the requirements of Project Ireland 2040. So it is exciting times and things are definitely starting to move. Um, so it is a time to, to shift to BIM. There's also funding that has been around uh, for a number of years that um, SMEs may not be aware of. Enterprise Ireland have been supporting their clients with uh, BIM adoption and BIM implementation and um, with significant funding for uh, the last uh, number of years. So it is time to shift to BIM. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker uh, who is going to uh, uh, talk about the benefits of BIM from a tabular data perspective, uh, perspective in the reams of FM under 6D and 7D models. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna uh, introduce uh, Dan, give some information about Dan's, Dan's background while he gets his slides ready. So Dan O'Gorman holds the position of Asset Lifecycle Lead for Fexion. Um, Dan has spent 18 years in high-end manufacturing and software development, plus 26 years on construction projects in Ireland, the UK, China, Middle East and Africa. Consequently, based on uh, that combined experience, he's going to talk today um, regarding the value of BIM from a single source of truth for tabular data, rather than the traditional focus on the visual element of 3D BIM and BIM objects. This is in the context of the growing emphasis of ESG driven metrics by owner operators, but delivering those prescribed targets in a frictionless way with minimal admin using uh, auto ID barcodes and NFC tags, coupled with smart field applications that provide ready access to manufacture, manufacturer uh, tabled EPDF, O&M manuals, uh, uh, product bulletins and product data templates when and if needed. So I'll uh, let Dan take it from there. Thanks, Dan. Emma, thanks for the comprehensive introduction. I don't think I have much more to say after that, but uh, I'll try my best. So I'll add some pictorials to what you just said. True, I mean, uh, this morning I too attended the, digi the digital project launch, and it was very interesting to see both government, academics, and the industry getting together to actually improve our industry. But to achieve that aim, they have to look at technology and data and the focus here, as you quite rightly said, there's been a huge amount of emphasis on BEM for the last 20 years. And unbelievably, it's been mainly focused up to now on the pictorial element of it. But the real essence of driving towards sustainability, better cost, better quality, and above all, from an FM perspective, where 85% to 90% of the total cost of ownership is actually expended, is in the data. And that is what's key. So the BIM can be the carrier for the data all the way through from design all the way through, but it has to be structured in a way. And as you can see here in the slide, this is what we do on Fexalon, in that we take on the left-hand side, these unconnected silos, and we actually transform, or into, transform it into one solution that is usable for the end owner operators and also for the environment as well, because it's because if we can get the data right and if you can measure it, you can fix it. So moving on then, what are we looking at? I mean, we all face these crises in every, every day, housing, housing shortages, fluctuating in material costs, particularly in the last couple of months where materials have gone through the roof to the extent, as Alan knows from, from what he's doing from a pure perspective, it is very difficult now for any contractor of any size to enter into a fixed cost, lump, fixed, fixed price lump sum contract, simply because they don't know what materials are gonna cost. Sustainability is in everybody's interest not just for this generation, but for generations to come. And what we've done as a generation in the last 40 years is having a huge impact on future generations and the generations today, and it's changing. ESG, every major corporation and government is now following the, the environment, the social and the governance aspects. And we have to change from thinking that we're green because we change the light bulbs or move to electric car. It's much more than that. It's again about data and making the right decisions at the design stage, because you start with the end in mind. As you can see on the right hand side, there's a huge emphasis in the UK with this golden thread as a, as a result of the catastrophe in Grenfell where 72 people lost their lives. Will they repeat what we've done in Ireland with BCAR or will they come up with something new? We are in the digital age. We've seen this more so than ever since COVID came along. 
and then the two years of digitization of all industries has taken off at a phenomenal pace and it has to continue in the construction industry as we get back to normal why why the client and its aec and stakeholders should engage single source of truth this is what we all want when i started off in construction in the 1970s for every one page we had back then unbelievably it's 40 pages now this is not me saying this this is from recent studies so we're proliferating paper very graphically you can see here we have more rules we have more regulations we still compliance but at the end of the day we end up with this and unfortunately we end up with having to put in systems like this like pcar and so forth but has it made a difference we're still seeing problems in the industry we're seeing still seeing quality issues these will be addressed as we move to modern methods of construction because they're moving to the factory as you said in the introduction i spent 20 years of my career working out of construction came back into it recently and didn't see much of a difference as far as the documentation and control is concerned and this leads all leads back to the bim model you know we want to avoid this type of situation where we're all overboarded with paper and if, as somebody said this morning at the conference, if we don't give everybody a vision as to what they are contributing to the end goal, i.e. if I move a PDF, if I file a PDF, am I making a difference? If they can't see the difference, then it's not sustainable. It is a waste of time. It is frustrating when these people could be doing what's valuable, i.e. contributing or building or avoiding problems in the construction sphere. As you can see here in, in a just back, back back this up, you can see here from a study from TU Dublin, on the right hand side, what are the what are the issues that are controlled? And how can the BEM model actually address what I've just highlighted in red? Very easy, again, back down to data. Low skilled manpower has been addressed by modern methods of construction, again, dependent on data. Unpredictable weather conditions, again, dependent on data. Lack of appropriate planning, absolutely dependent on getting the planning regulations compliant, but first of all, if I get permission for to build a building in Galway, then why can't I get permission to build the exact same building in Cork? There needs to be uniformity, again, data driven. Complexity works. We all know that buildings have become more complex and we have to address that. So the end problem is this 60% of major capital programs fall, fail to meet cost. 30% of construction is rework. It's, it's incredible. I mean, imagine if you had this in the manufacturing industry, costs would be through the roof. And maintenance, repair, reactive. This is what we have to avoid. And again, this is data driven. And you can see here causes of rework. Again, incredibly, it's down to inaccurate documentation. This all flows from the single source of truth. And the single source of truth is supposed to be the better model. So we look at the amount of paper that we've created, and then 35% of their time is in non productive activities. And then we scratch our heads and wonder why people are leaving the industry. We wonder why we can't attract the best graduates into the industry. How can you if they're spending 35% of their time in non productive activities? This is not what people expected when they joined this fantastic industry that we're all involved in. If you look at ESG, it has to be looked on a full circle basis. On the top of the slide here, you can see the people who make, who make the investors. These are the bank lenders, owners and operators and investors. And all they want is all these people in this circle actually working together in tandem. They want the architects and engineers understanding what's in the EIR. They want the manufacturers providing the best, best available product. But more importantly, these manufacturers now have a duty of care to actually provide data. Under the new building safety bill in the UK, these architects are now responsible for the design for 15 years. That's one five years post practical completion. So therefore, they are dependent on the information coming from these manufacturers. That is in the BIM model. That is what feeds the BIM model. And BIM models are becoming smarter because they have to become smarter. Construction companies actually are dependent on these two players to actually give them the information that they want. I was talking to somebody this morning that told me that, that during COVID, because of the shutdown, they got longer time to pre-plan. And the actual project came in way below budget simply because they had the time because of COVID to spend more upfront planning and therefore avoid the issues that I identified earlier in the report from TU Dublin. And at the end of the day, local residents have to be satisfied, building occupiers have to be, has to be satisfied, and environmental groups have to be satisfied. And what does, what's required? Trust. Trust comes as is, is a necessity for all these people to work together. Because if these people up here at the top don't trust these people on the on the right, then we're going to fall down. 
if these companies here, these organizations on the left hand side don't trust all the other parties, then they're going to become overburdensome as far as regulation is concerned, which, which impacts the productivity of all the people on the right hand side. It's a simple circle. ESG is becoming predominant in everything that we do, and it's the corporate driven. So as you can see here, we have to look at what is driving ESG and what can we in the construction industry influence. As you can see here in the green highlights, all these items that you see here under environmental, social and governments are impacted by the AEC and the FM sector. So, and if you take an example into, into real terms, Johnson & Johnson have a facility in Limerick, but they also have a facility in Sweden and they're able to sell product at a higher rate, at a higher price in shops, simply because they've green credentials on it. Therefore, so there is a return on investment of being sustainable. And in Ireland, Johnson & Johnson have 3,000 people working for them. But if you look at all the other companies, there's 276,000 people involved in foreign direct investment. And all these FDI companies invariably follow ESG standards. And those ESG standards are turned into EIRs, which actually impact on the construction and the architects of what the expectation. These people, 276K and their managers expect higher standards equal to what they get outside the construction industry from those who supply the construction industry. Again, the EU has something to play and the Irish government is driving this. So you can see here of last Thursday, there's been an update on the construction products regulation. As you can see here, facilitates circular reuse, requiring products to carry digital data, which is again data, improve the standardization process, Again, and getting the standards. Again, as I said earlier, if you get plant admission in Galway, why can't you get plant admission in Cork for the exact same building? We have to have standardization because you cannot digitize if you don't standardize. So we also talk about social. You can see here Cadbury's, it's Easter, Cadbury's big selling time of Easter eggs. But on Monday, there was a Ch Channel 4 program about child, and this has impacted our sales already. So everybody has to be conscious of the social impact. Contractors should engage because they're key players. And why? Because their costs are going through the roof. As you can see here, all the reports in February actually indicated how bad things are in this particular area. And it's not their fault, but they have to carry the can if the contracts are prescriptive enough that they don't have this. So getting back to the BEM situation. So as you can see here, 1990, we had CAD 2000, 2010, 4D, 60, 60, 70 is coming on the road. But what's the difference? 3D, yes, we need the imagery. But for 4D, 5D, 6D, and 7D, data. But the data has to flow with the images that we have or the objects that we have inside in the original BIM model. But as far as operate the building in, in 6 and 6D, it is data that they want. A technician standing in front of an air handling unit does not, does not want to see a picture of the air handling unit because he's standing in front of it. What he wants is the data that was originally put into the model at day one and contributes to by the manufacturers, as I said earlier. So what is the difference is BEM design, BEM modules, BEM as built, and BEM for FM. BEM is no longer just in this area. It has to spread into this area if we're serious about sustainability and ESG. I'll skip this, I'm running out of time. So to give you a typical example, if any, if any of you have a house at home and has double glazing or triple glazing, and the neighbor's kid, not your own kid, obviously, puts the football or, hurl, or the slitter through the window, you have to go and look at a number here. This is the number that you'll see inside in the aluminium, excuse me. So what do you do with this number? Well, who do I, uh, as the Ghostbusters, who do I contact? Easy answer is, if this was a GS1 standard code, this number 505 tells you that this is Munster Joinery. And therefore, by standardization in the exact same way as the box of cornflakes you buy in Dunn stores or in Tesco, and you can take that same box of cornflakes and bring it out to Timbuktu, Shanghai, the Antarctic, the Arctic, anywhere in the world. And as long as they have an EPOS system, which is electronic point to sale cash register, it will still show a box of cornflakes. It will show a different currency. It will show a different uh, price, obviously. But it's still a box of conflicts. Why? Because they're using a global standard, which is the GS1 standard that's in everything you buy. 92% of products that are sold across the counter in hardware stores and building merchants in Ireland have a, G, a G10 number. Why can't we use that number? We don't. This is an air handling unit. Cost, 
37,000. On the right hand side is a pint of milk. You can see the amount of information on the side of the pint of milk versus what you have on the side of an air handling unit. This is data. This is what the BIM model needs to provide. The BIM model needs to provide as much information as the, as the, as the 80, 85% to 135% bottle. Why? And why is the bottle dearer? Because it's a higher standard. This is temporary milk. You can see the QR code in it. You, if you scan that QR code, and we've all become familiar with QR codes since COVID, you can actually see the cows in the field in temporary that produce that milk. That is customer engagement. That is about the future. That is about getting people involved. Final slide is interoperability with scan and tap. We talk about SMEs and you mentioned it earlier. How do you bring those involved? We are all involved in the digital age. But as you can see here with Revolut, if you had this type of system within the construction industry, then the contractors would know at the end of the week where they're spending money, what projects. You would eliminate all the things on the left-hand side and support the CO2 and CO2 standards. And we take the banks, finance, you would naturally think that they would be behind the curve. When in fact, because of Revolut coming into the market, they have taught all the other banks what to do next. You see AIB, Bank of Ireland, and all the traditional banks have now got to get in line with what Revolut is doing. And I travel, as I said to people this morning, I have a son and two, two grandchildren, and his wife in New Zealand, and we travel out there extensively before COVID. My wife could take out her Revolut card in New Zealand and within an instant, even before she got the, got the tail receipt, she would have a text message in New Zealand from an Irish bank, which her money's in an Irish bank, obviously, and would show how much she's spending. And at the end of the week, she'd get a summary. Why can't we do this for the SMEs in Ireland? And that is, again, about data. So it's about cop. It's not reinventing the wheel. It's about this. It's about having a process, end-to-end -end flow, but starting with the end in mind. That's my presentation. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you very much, Dan, and such an important message that you, you've shared with um, everybody today and the importance of data. So I suppose it gives us an understanding of why we're actually developing this information within um, the, the, the project right through the, the project life cycle. And ultimately, you're looking at that environmental, social and governance aspect um, and being able to um, meet the, the, the industry requirements. I really liked the point that you made about um, you cannot digitize if you cannot standardize. I think that's a really important message as well. And you're highlighting how relevant the International Information Management Standards, ISO 19650 are with that comment. Um, and how powerful is it to be able to, to access all of that data by scanning a QR code um, in that kind of um, uh, standardized way so really important message there. Thanks very much, Dan. No problem, um, my pleasure, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we're gonna keep, um, keep things moving and uh, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, which is uh, Monica Malacic. Uh, Monica is Operations Manager with Digital Construction Technologies Group based in Croatia. Um, and her um, presentation today is about the benefits and challenges of day-to-day -day BIM. Um, as, uh, um, uh, before Monica starts, um, aside from managing the growth of the Croatian office for DCT, she's responsible for information management, BIM coordination and problem solving on various construction projects in the data centre, healthcare and residential industry. Monica is a Women in BIM regional lead, good woman Monica, uh, for Croatia and co-editor of um, the BIM Dictionary uh, Croatia. Having worked as a BIM consultant, um, with build, uh, Building Smart Professional Certification. Um, uh, she is a, a, a build smart, Building Smart Professional Certification Lecturer um, and an ISO 9001 2015 Quality Management Representative. She's skilled in the implementation of BIM processes in design and engineering offices. Um, so you're very welcome, Monica, and looking forward to um, hearing about the benefits and challenges of day-to-day -day BIM. I'll leave it over to you, thank you. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Dan, for a great presentation. Uh, sending greetings from sunny Zagreb. It's very nice to be here and talk about all the benefits about the challenges of the day-to-day -day BIM. So in this pre presentation for, I hopefully, uh, hopefully for 15 minutes, I will show you all the classic benefits that you probably heard a thousand times 
like uh, BIM benefits, uh, with BIM you can benefit with coordination, with collaboration, with time management and similar. But today I will show you on the real time uh, and real project uh, examples, all the benefits and, and show you how you can actually achieve them. But I don't want to fool you, it will be hard. So there are challenges, but I will, I will show you how to overcome them and uh, surely show you uh, the reasons why our challenges are here. So before I go to my presentation, I want to just uh, grab a few minutes uh, of yours and uh, present our company. So I'm working for DCT uh, in DCT in Croatia as operations manager, like Emma said. DCT, as uh, probably most of you know, is a BIM and virtual design consulting firm. Currently, we have offices in Ireland, Croatia and Argentina, and we employ 40 highly skilled and qualified BIM professionals. We are focusing on BIM, on virtual design, on digital information management, geospatial and, and asset management. When we opened our uh, office here in Croatia, we were aware of the challenges, of the risks, but also uh, about opportunities that, that we can have here in Croatia. So related to that, I will try to explain you what is the current situation about BIM implementation here in, in, in Croatia. So when it comes to this presentation, I uh, used analysis of the use of BIM in Croatia from University of Zagreb. Uh, this survey was from 2020. Uh, so from this survey, we got data that 21% of Croatian companies use BIM. Most of them, 25% uh, of architects are using the uh, BIM in their daily life. Uh, so we can say that designers stand out as the most diligent BIM users. Unfortunately, just 4% of contractors uh, apply BIM, but the good thing is that uh, most of respondents plan to use BIM within two years. Because this is survey from 2020, my prognosis is to have a clearer and maybe better picture about, about BIM in 2024 and 2025 in, here in, in Croatia. When we are talking about different, um, I don't know, organization or, or legal aspect of BIM here in Croatia, we can say that Croatia is from the beginning uh, of EU BIM task group is member of EU task group. Also, uh, what is uh, very important to mention is that many chambers have their like uh, working groups that are that are one they want to implement and. Uh, promote the BIM as the process. So like the Chamber of Civil Engineers published uh, two different guidelines. One is general of BIM and the other one is uh, about infrastructure projects. But currently when it comes to projects um, that are using the BIM and that want to use a BIM uh, here in Croatia, I need to mention two things. The first one that uh, today, if uh, Croatian roads for all their tenders uh, are demanding usage of BIM, BIM processes, and also BIM models. And the another thing that uh, have been recently in, in Croatia after the series of earthquakes, especially in, in area of uh, Zagreb city, the Ministry of Construction uh, with alongside with World Bank uh, have a few different standards uh, related to uh, new buildings for hospitals and, and schools that are demanding the process, the beam, uh, the models during the design and construction phase. You're, you're all welcome to LinkedIn and Twitter. It does so much damage uh, because it, it really does. Because people know because... What? Sorry. No, I can okay. respond on email, but it's just this, this, this idea that you can leave a comment in. Sorry, Alan, could okay, you mute, you know. please? Cheers. Sorry, Alan, could you mute your mic, please? <laughs> so, uh, as I was saying, uh, here in Croatia are like baby steps when it comes to BIM, but, but as I said, my prognosis for Croatia and the BIM adoption here is 2024 and uh, 25. So we will have a, I think, clearer picture uh, about BIM implementation here in, in this region. So when it comes to the change uh, here in Croatia worldwide, 
I, I, I think in, in Ireland too, to have a successful change, to have a successful change process, you need to have a few basic points that, that will, because of them, you will achieve, uh, you will achieve successful change. So in this particular slide, you can see that there are like five um, most important points when it comes to change. You have, you gotta have a vision, you gotta have a knowledge to get there. You must see the benefits. Uh, you must have the capacity of yourself, of your team that thinks like just like you. And also you gotta have a great action plan. So the question is, what if uh, you have everything, but you just don't have the one point. Will you achieve the, the change? So the answer is no, because if you don't have just one of these points, you will have confusion, anxiety, frustration, resistance, or anything else. So you have, you got to have all these five um, points to, to um, be the, to have successful change process. So when it comes to BIM, when it comes to your daily life, this is like the recipe for, for successful, su successful change. Uh, re related to that, we will talk today, as I mentioned, about the benefits and how to actually achieve them. You have, as you probably know, as you probably read or, or seen in different con conference, you have different types of benefits when it comes to BIM. I will mention today just four of them. So that are mitigate risks, higher quality work, improve collaboration, and also uh, improve on, uh, better coordination. So let me start with mitigate risks. When we're talking about mitigate risks, I don't think just about mitigate risks for investors. I think about mitigate risks risk for all stakeholders, including us engineers, BIM specialists, and similar. The key uh, point to do that is the fine key points on the project start, not in the middle of the project, not during the project, just in the middle, just in the start of the project. To do that, you can see, and you probably heard about different documents such as ERR, BP, exchange information requirement, B, B, BIM execution plan, and similar you can find all these documents online free of charge. And uh, with these documents, you can help yourself, your team, your investor to have a great project, to, set, to have a successful project. On this slide, you can see like uh, our internal checklist when we are talking about BIM, when we're talking about the BIM execution plan and few points that are maybe the most important to have a good start, to have a good, good kickoff of the, of the BIM project. So as I mentioned, um, you have online like these documents on this slide, uh, you will find just three of them that are must, uh, that are using uh, in the different BIM projects worldwide here in Croatia, in Ireland, in Germany, everywhere. The same the same documents are are using uh, for the projects. When I'm talking about higher quality work, so I'm th I'm thinking about monitoring of change and also reducing the delay. When we talk about higher quality work, that is something that you uh, can see with your own eyes in the model, in your uh, daily work, in, in your daily daily tasks. For this particular uh, example, I choose something that we are dealing with mostly in the construction stage, and that is openings in the walls and slabs. So openings in the walls and slabs in the construction projects are really important thing. And if we do not coordinate them properly and on time, we have a great cost during the construction and uh, we have frustrated uh, team and investor. So for this example, on the right side, you can see a few screenshots from, from the models that we are currently working on. You can see different openings and their are different like elements such as um, descriptions and, and the color. So the first thing to do when, when it comes to um, higher quality work and when it comes to great modeling and great coordination, you will need to set like uh, rules, uh, arrange rules for everything you do. So related to the openings, when we are approaching to that problem, first thing we, we want to do is uh, 
have a set of rules, have a like a set of uh, information that we want to be included in each element. On the right side, you can see just few of them. They are related to the dimensions. They are related to approval approved um, from fire specialist. They are related for phase fire rating and, and similar. So when you are in BIM model and when you click on the element, you've got all of this information just by one click. The second thing that we are doing, we are using color coding because it's it's really great thing and it's really something that you can see with all on your with your eyes and uh, that it, it is clear what's happening in the in the model. So when you have We lost Monica there. You might have lost Monica there. Yeah, I think I thought it was just on my side. Um, we'll just give her one or two minutes to to um, uh, try and get working again. Uh, just while we're waiting for Monica to, to get back online there. Um, like already, um, I know Monica hasn't finished her presentation, but um, she's covered a, an awful lot of really important uh, information about um, a, a company, especially an SME's company, to shift to BIM. Um, so, um, you know, talking about how in Croatia, although they don't have a government mandate, they are you, they are starting to see that there are government agencies who are mandating uh, uh, BIM on uh, projects. Do we have Monica back? Yes, sorry. Super. Sorry. No problem, Monica. Internet. We'll give you a second just to, to share your screen. We were just talking um, about how, um, although there isn't a government mandate in Croatia, um, there's obviously government agencies are requiring BIM on, on projects, which is excellent. But I'll hand back over to you so you can finish off your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a minute, please. Let me share my screen properly. Yeah, it looks good this side. Uh, yeah, okay. So I was talking about high quality work and uh, these particular examples that, that we had in the office. So when you have everything, information and geometry in one model properly and with the good quality, you on your on, on time delivery is guaranteed and your monitoring of changes is, is actually very, very easy. So when it comes to improving collaboration, I'm talking about all these common data environments and different services that are available uh, today on the market. So on the market today, you have endless possibilities when it comes to the common data environments, uh, when it comes to sharing information, not sharing information through email, uh, just sharing information through one one spot where everyone on the team, every project stakeholder can reach out for the information, filter it, uh, grab it whenever it, it, it wants, and it is accessible anywhere and anytime. And that's the most important thing. So when it comes to uh, improving collaboration in our, our uh, offices, we are using um, the, depending on the project, mostly all common data environments uh, with a proper uh, folder structure, with proper naming convention, with daily notification of changes. So uh, related to that, if you have all that settled down in the beginning of the project in BEP and EER, you have a really successful collaboration and really successful project. So when it comes to battle coordination for my daily, uh, work. This is like the most important thing, uh, doing clash detections, reports, project progress and similar. So, for example, here I have took a few screenshots of coordination of services, walk paths and goalposts. These are all issues that probably engineers from the site have every day because they are not using the BIM. If you are using the BIM, if you are see the problem before it's even on the construction site, you're actually building before it's built. So using clash detection tool or with just visual check of federated model, your coordination with all disciplines is, are on the higher level. 
So with tracking progress of each team and issues through different reports that uh, can be exported automatically from these softwares, from, the, from these platforms, or, or, or you can just uh, grab all your own like reports and track all the issues and track all uh, the situation uh, about each, each theme in the project. When it comes to challenges uh, and how to overcome them, I will just mention a few of them that are related to this, reg this region, in particular in Croatia. But uh, I think that everything is the same in Ireland, everything is the same in, in, in Germany or any other country. So, okay, we have like um, four faulty, we have BIM, and that doesn't guarantee that we'll have a good model. That doesn't guarantee that we'll have a quality model. So when we, when we are talking about poor quality model, maybe we should say, okay, garbage in, garbage out. Maybe with that phrase will be, will be the clearer picture of what I'm talking about. So if we are defining each team scope in the beginning of the project, if we uh, have been project uh, without uh, BIM manager, which is very frustration, uh, we will have actually poor quality model. No one will check that model. So we need to define each team scope and we need to define the roles on the project and in-house to have a quality model. The another thing that is problem here in Croatia is that owners lack of knowledge. Uh, our owners, our investors are actually don't know what is BIM. Uh, if any one of them heard about BIM, they just say, okay, I want BIM, but they don't actually know what are they wanting. So in that order, um, it is important for us engineers, for BIM consultants to give free consultation to investors, to show them the benefits of BIM and together with them define proper documentation in the beginning of the project. When we talk about implementation cost, when we talk about culture change, that is uh, like the biggest challenge for, for construction industry. Uh, the thing is that when it comes to, I don't know, a standard company and we, which have like strategical, tactical and operative uh, management, it is important to start with strategic, strategic management from their motivation and their understanding that there will be drops in productivity during the, the adoption phase, but after that adoption phase, productivity will increase. So related to that, uh, a good time management change in the policy process technology people are just right way to start all uh, proper change for, for BIM. Uh, when you buy BIM software, that doesn't mean that you are implementing the BIM. You need to change policy, you need to change process, and you need to motivate the, the people and, and your team. When it comes to really cost, because here in Croatia, the problem is always um, the softwares are too expensive, uh, platforms are too expensive and similar. So today you have so many grants for digitalization, you have so many grants grants from state, for, from EU funds, Emma mentioned once. So that, that particular problem about cost, that I think that is not really a problem anymore because of that grants for, for digitalization and actually, actually for BIM. So I want to finish my presentation uh, with this quote from Peter Drucker. There is nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency something that should not be done at all. So maybe for us all to think about with about our daily work, about our work in the team, and to see how can we change and benefit our day-to-day -day business and actually implement the BIM uh, on the efficient and easiest way. So. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I hope that uh, you will find this presentation useful and uh, sorry for the internet connection. I hope that uh, we will chat soon uh, live. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. Um, a, a really interesting perspective um, for, for the, um, the attendees today to actually see, um, obviously uh, there's been a lot about the benefits of, of BIM, but uh, to see how you've actually implemented it within uh, a business and have executed it on projects. Um, and also, um, uh, I suppose, highlighting that 
without a, a kind of a clear vision or a, a, an implementation strategy, um, it's, it's quite difficult to implement them within a, a business. So you've really highlighted how the, that challenge can be overcome, along with the other challenges you noted. Um, so although they are challenges, you've shown how they can be overcome. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to move straight on to our next speaker because I know we're a little bit behind time uh, now. So um, just give um, Jonathan a chance to um, share a slide. He's already done that. Um, so our next speaker is Jonathan Reinhardt. Um, he is an Autodesk uh, Technical Consultant with Diatech, and he's going to talk about collaboration technologies for your shift to BIM. Jonathan is a uh, chartered architectural technologist. Um, and as I mentioned, a technical consultant with Diatech. Uh, and he's also a lecturer in Technological University Dublin uh, in the architectural technology course. And um, he has 17 years experience designing, managing and advising across the AEC uh, industry in Ireland, Australia and the UK. And he has worked on commercial projects and extensively in micro, small and medium uh, uh, size uh, residential pro uh, projects using BIM and the latest design technologies. He holds an MSc master's degree in BIM management and a BSc honors degree in architectural technology. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. And, and thank you, Monica and, and Dan for your, your presentations. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. I'll, I'll, I'll try not keep you uh, too long. Uh, but as, as Emma introduced me, I, I, I don't need to cover any of that stuff. So what I'm gonna go through in the next few minutes is different types of collaboration technologies that I've seen in the industry and that I also see uh, with Diatech customers that are being used today as well. So some pretty exciting stuff uh, that I, I, I luckily get to see on a daily basis uh, a couple of times a day. You know, I see lots of new things with the various different customers that we deal with. And some of the technologies that I'll speak about today, something called Visual Live, uh, a new product called SpaceMaker from Autodesk. Uh, an integration called ACC Connect and Autodesk Construction Cloud. So they're kind of the four key technologies that I'll discuss today. And, you know, relating back to primarily, you know, what Dan said about data being so important, you know, I couldn't agree anymore with that. And, and BIM is, is gone beyond what was, you know, initially just a visual 3D model, essentially, or, or fancy kind of BIM model. You know, the information is a huge part of that and data is extremely important. And how that data moves uh, you know, ideally with the BIM model through various technologies or through various platforms is extremely important. And that's hopefully what I'm going to go, going to communicate to you in the next few minutes as well is, is how your data can move through various platforms, uh, whether that's Autodesk technology, whether it's, you know, Microsoft OneDrive or Google Drive or SharePoint, you know, there's lots of different options out there. And these can all integrate because, you know, in an ideal world, we all work in the same platform, but, you know, none of us actually do. So I think on a real project, we know how complex projects and, and information silos and locations can be. So hopefully I can get some of that across today. So just to mention some of these technologies that we're seeing are used in the industry and one is called Visual Live. Um, so Visual Live is an augmented reality tool. And um, we're seeing this uh, being used a lot more on, on construction stage uh, projects, pretty large construction stage projects. Uh, so, you know, it uses something, it will use the Microsoft HoloLens, but it also works on an iPad as well. So that it takes your BIM model and puts it into your environment uh, and puts that, that data in front of you right on, on the construction site as well. And then you can raise issues and, and various different comments and markups against that. And it does, it works directly from BIM 360, Navisworks and Revit as well. So just something I wanted to, to, to point out to you, either, you know, primarily for construction stage, but obviously has, has design relevance as well. Um, another product I just want to, to mention and something that, that definitely got me excited when it was first released, uh, Autodesk acquired this company, uh, it may have been about a year ago if I remember correctly, uh, they acquired this Nordic space company and it's basically an AI uh, generative design tool, uh, it's available today, you're able to sign up for a free trial and stuff like that, uh, so it's definitely worth having a look. But I think this is showing where the industry is at the moment in certain places, but where I believe it's going in terms of these generative design tools and automation uh, and artificial intelligence. And I think it's extremely important. And even relating that back to the data element, a tool like SpaceMaker, for example, 
It can analyze uh, planning codes for certain degrees of planning codes. You can set certain standards with it uh, in regards to open space, uh, check certain daylighting elements. So this is primarily used at the early design stage, but it does take in local data into it as well. So it's definitely worth worth having a look at, primarily for, for architects, I would probably say, but also very relevant to developers. And what it can do, it will actually optioneer and generate multiple options on a particular site. Um, so it, it, it's geolocated that site within the Space Baker environment. Um, and you can say how many apartments you want, how high you want to go, the offset you want from the street, and it will generate various different options based on that as well. And I think if my screenshot plays here, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so it, it's just generating a couple of different options there and you can save all of those different options at that very kind of early design stage, maybe before, you know, before you're going for planning or, you know, maybe you're just at the brief or early design stage with a developer, perhaps. So that that's potentially one of those tools you, you could look at for that kind of early stage design. And data is extremely important as part of this as well, because it takes in uh, local local information as well and, and relates back to that too. So the, another tool that I want to mention is something called ACC Connect. And we see coming up quite a lot with, with Diatech customers and even myself uh, with conversations I've had with, with companies and people as well. Um, it's been able to integrate with other platforms. It's becoming more and more of a topic and more and more of a need as well. And there is the, one of the tools that we're looking at here in Diatech is something called ACC Connect. And this, you can connect, for example, BIM 360, you can connect uh, Autodesk Construction Cloud, but it also integrates with the likes of SharePoint, uh, the likes of Google Drive, the likes of Dropbox as well. So if you put a file into a common data environment that happens to be in Google Drive or happens to be in BIM 360, you can get it to replicate the file automatically by building something called a recipe. Um, and it will transfer that data over uh, almost immediately as well. So that's something called ACC Connect. Uh, it's a very exciting product, in my opinion, because it's really, you know, it's bridging the gap between, you know, using multi-platforms, which happens on a lot of projects or most projects where we're using multiple platforms. Uh, it's kind of bridging that gap and, uh, you know, very, very exciting piece of technology that I've seen out there um, as well. And then just what I want to, 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 to finish on, uh, I just want to touch on Autodesk Construction Cloud. The reason I want to talk about this is I, I kind of want to touch on the transition of information, uh, you know, the transition of data, you know, both in to, to, to what relation to, to Monica and Dan have previously spoke about as well. So it, hopefully it's kind of underpinned what I'm going to run through here as well. So Autodesk Construction Cloud, for those of you that don't know, um, you know, it, 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 it's a common data environment. With a, with a lot of bells and whistles and a lot of extra functionality in there. And it's made for the architecture, engineering and construction industry. So yes, it stores your files, but it does a whole lot more. It allows you to create RFIs, for example, it allows you to, to manage your cost plans on site, uh, create estimations within takeoff, even allows you to, to make changes in Revit and then synchronize those changes back up into your common data environment. And like what Dan mentioned about the single source of truth, you know, Autodesk Construction Cloud largely fits that kind of bill as well. It is that single source of truth. The reason for that is, you know, architects, engineers can all use it at design stage. And then that information can transition and, and make that journey all within that single source of truth. Uh, you know, at pretender stage for estimation, for example, you can do all of that within Autodesk Construction Cloud within something called Autodesk Takeoff. So you can look at that kind of pre-construction um, stage kind of information and leveraging that design information, that same design model that has moved through as well. And then once you get to site stage, for example, um, you know, you, you, you can use that same BIM model and that same data that was generated on the project and iterated through the design process. You can then on, on site, you can use iPads, mobile devices to link back to that information. You can generate lists of assets, for example. You can generate uh, barcodes and attach them to, uh, you know, like um, Dan's example of the, the, the window frame and the numbers on window frames and identifying that. You can do all of that inside Autodesk Build. Uh, you generate barcode system on, on any sort of online tool and you can link it to an asset within Autodesk Build. Therefore, when someone comes along with, with their mobile device on site, um, they can scan a barcode or a QR code and it will bring up the asset within Autodesk Construction Cloud. And keep in mind that this asset that's being scanned on site, whether it's an air handling unit, a door frame, a window frame, a desk, a piece of furniture, as long as the barcode is attached to it, uh, it's going to pull up that information for you as soon as it gets scanned on, on the mobile phone. And the key thing with that is, is 
that information, you know, that's the same information that was potentially generated at design stage. And it's just made a couple of hops through the same platform to make it to site stage as well. So if you consider of it a kind of a, an all in one platform, almost, you know, it, it, it really caters for the design stage as well as that, that kind of construction stage as well. So there's lots of different other things for various different stages. These are effectively four different subscriptions or four different products. You know, you got your design stage, you got your, your pre-design stage for takeoff. And then uh, for Autodesk build, you've, you've kind of got your site stage features in there. And what I just want to touch on briefly then, for those of you that maybe haven't seen the platform. So, you know, a, a BIM model and that data that Dan talks about as well, that starts in a BIM authoring tool, whether that's Revit or another piece of tool uh, or a piece of software or a different type of tool. That starts effectively as a 3D model uh, to a certain degree at design stage. I appreciate there's a lot of documentation goes before that as well. But this information starts within our, our BIM model, within our BIM authoring tool. So with something like Autodesk Construction Cloud, I can go to my Revit toolbar and I can send that straight up to the Construction Cloud immediately. It'll be there a couple of minutes later, a couple of seconds later, depending on the size of your model. If I click this roof, for example, I can see all of my data here on the left-hand side. All of that data is also transferred into Autodesk Construction Cloud as well. So effectively, I can go in on my mobile device if I want, uh, or on my iPad on site, or even in the design office, I can choose that same roof and I can see that same data in here as well. If it's a fire rating, if it's a specification, and um, if it's a finish, if it's any type of paint color or anything like that, all of that transfers into Autodesk Construction Cloud as well. So it is a 3D model, but all of that data is attached to it, which is extremely, extremely important. But I suppose it's not, when we talk about data, it's not only the model data that we need to consider, it's also the site data that we need to consider as well. So the construction capture data, so things like RFIs, for example, things like checklists, that's all relevant data to, to make your project run that bit smoother and for that better quality finished as well. So, you know, Autodesk Construction Cloud also caters for that type of data as well. And what I mean by that, you know, as I mentioned about assets and stuff like that. So, for example, let's say something's installed on site. We take a photograph of it. This is a door handle in my house, by the way. Uh, take a photograph of that door handle. We can attach a number of different tags to it within our Autodesk Construction Cloud. And all of these tags are then searchable if we've lots of different tags within the environment as well. We can tag all of that. But what I can also do with this photograph as well is I can link it to the asset list that exists in Autodesk Construction Cloud. The asset list is effectively what contains the barcode and it will bring me back to the asset list there as well. So that photograph is attached to that asset. But that photograph is also attached to an RFI that was generated in the platform as well. And all of this 3D design information that was generated by the architect, the engineer, designer, this is all the information that is now made as a site as well as that, that asset information as well. So that RFI that was captured on site, that can be linked back to that photograph. It can be linked back to that asset as well. But that RFI at construction stage, it can also be linked back to the original BIM model or back to the architect's BIM model as well, all from within that single platform. Um, and even things, so things like checklists as well, we can generate a safety checklist or a BCAR checklist, and we can relate that checklist back to the asset, for example. We can relate that checklist back to that BIM model or back to any piece of data that sits within the cloud um, that, that we want to connect it with as well. So the key thing with this is that all of your data from design stage is in that single, single location, and it moves just through various different platforms and various different functions as you get to the site and even to the handover stage as well. And um, what I'll also mention on this is, uh, sorry, with Autodesk Takeoff, which I kind of meant to squeeze in there in the middle, that same BIM model design model at early design stage and that same potential, you know, RFI that was generated on site for that door handle, in the middle of that, you know, uh, process, uh, the, the, the takeoff could have been generated for that also within Autodesk Construction Cloud. So for example, all of those door handles that now an RFI was produced for, they could have been quantified within the Autodesk Construction Cloud. And again, bringing it back to data, all of that data at that estimation stage or takeoff stage all relates back to potentially to a BIM model. It can also be 2D drawings as well, but then it can also be pulled out of the platform and given to our estimators or given to our QSs to, to generate bill of materials and, and, and uh, various different schedules for the building as well. So this is just an export directly from Autodesk Construction Cloud. 
of that particular takeoff package uh, that was generated with inside Autodesk Construction Cloud. Um, so if I just close that for a moment, and then just to kind of tie all of this together and everything that I've spoken about, uh, so docs, you know, that's where your design model sits and design collaboration. So our, our design models with our architects are sitting there. And then if we just, all we have to do is click at build stage, uh, at the construction stage, and then we just go in there and we can link back to that design information um, and generate our BCAR checklist in here again, for example, and link that back to that docs environment, uh, back into that uh, 3D uh, model or back into that BIM model. Uh, and then the same goes for assets or anything else that we, we generate with inside uh, Autodesk Construction Cloud. Uh, so hopefully that was uh, 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 informative for you all. Thank you all for listening. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Uh, great to see um, Autodesk continuing to, to um, uh, improve and, and um, include new um, tools to, to help with the digital construction process um, and also Diatech being at the cutting edge of that whenever um, uh, Autodesk uh, implements new tools. Really exciting to see that AI space maker um, uh, tool. Can't wait to have a go of that. That looks really exciting. Um, and also the AEC, uh, ACC Connect is such an important um, um, uh, function um, within the, the Autodesk suite to be able to connect all of that data and that really useful and important data to other aspects of, of your business or of, of your project. So. Um, thank you as always for um, giving such a, a really comprehensive overview of that. Um, before I make my closing uh, remarks, I just want to hand over to uh, Alan Hoare. He just wants to talk about the upcoming um, uh, um, uh, sessions and um, I'll make some closing remarks, Alan, just after you finish. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Emma. And, um, and thank you, Dan and Monica and Jonathan for really Excellent presentations. This is why the alliance is 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 an alliance. This this is what we do. We connect you to innovation. So thank you also to the CT team and to our sponsors. I'd like to I, I'd like to introduce you to our next event, which is sorry if you could just go back one slide, please. Oh, sorry. I'd like to introduce you to our next event, which is in May. We have a couple of events in May. And you, some of you may be aware that we have a digital housing series. We've got six events in association with Enterprise Ireland. And next month, we'll be looking at digital planning. So we'll have contributions from the, um, from, uh, the LGMA, the Local Government Management Agency, and from Tipperary County Council. We're also hoping also to hear from a residential builder. We hear there's a lot of issues out there in regard to uh, delays uh, due to planning. And I hope you can join us on the 12th of May. It's an important event. And as you're probably aware, there will be an announcement later this year about this, the construction, construction center, which will be focusing on this particular uh, housing aspect uh, for the first year of its formation. Uh, we'll also be, I also want to introduce you to the next major event that CETA will be hosting in June. So we can go to the next slide, please. Lenia? Okay. Uh, yes, this is our CETA Tech Live 2022 event. And we have open, uh, we have a process open now to receive expressions of interest. Broadly, we're looking at three major challenges facing construction, decarbonization, resource scarcity, and as Dan mentioned, procurement reform. So what we're doing is we're building this program from the bottom up. This is a hybrid event. We will have two days online, one day in person. This will be the first time we'll be having an in-person event on the 17th of June. And what we're asking you, and I've just been looking through the list of attendees, and it's, it's great to see such support today. You know, we'd love to see more people submitting proposals to uh, this event. Uh, there's an expression of interest form. You simply fill it in. You pick the challenge that we've identified. So if you go to the next slide, please, uh, Lenia, you see there are 10 challenges. I'm not going to read them all out, but you can broadly categorize them, as I said, into decarbonization, sustainability, resource scarcity, challenges about in regard to, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, making a more attractive industry. And of course, lots of issues around procurement reform. So you pick your challenge and it'd be great to see collaborative proposals coming in. Um, we have a number of great sponsors for the event, but it'd be great to see people coming together. It was mentioned earlier about Build Digital. 
CETA are really, really excited about Build Digital. Um, we're delighted to be working on that project because it's a real opportunity for government and industry and academia to work together. For the first time, this has been done. So thank you to our sponsors, but there's always room for more sponsors. CETA really uh, do appreciate this, any support you can give us. So please, please, please join us in June. Put in your challenge and we'd love to hear from you because some of the solutions to these are um, can be quite simple and some really super technology and services around. So we might even get one from, from, uh, from Zagreb. Let's see. So listen, thank you so much, Emma. You're doing a great job. I hope I haven't gone too long. And uh, please give your support to our event in June. And we'd love, we're looking forward, we're really looking forward to meeting uh, our sponsors and our members in person uh, on the 17th of June in Dublin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alan. And we have gone over time, so we won't have time for any Q&A, unfortunately. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, finish off this um, session of the technology trend series by uh, just making one uh, short closing remark. Um, firstly, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, it's really important um, for, for um, the attendees to, to um, get as much out of these sessions as possible. Um, and thank you very much to um, Dan, Monica, and Jonathan for their really, really um, interesting um, and comprehensive uh, presentations today. I suppose that we started off by talking about, you know, BIM and digital construction has been around for, for well, much longer than, than uh, 12 years that I've been involved in it. Um, and like, it seemed like such an obvious thing for the industry to, to um, transition to, but it has been slow. Um, but with, the, um, the reasons, as Dan explained, why we should be doing this is so we can have really good, useful data about our uh, assets um, and to be able to use that so that we are working more effectively and also to be able to um, input into that environmental, social and governance aspect of, of um, the, the uh, environment. Um, and then Monica explained how you know how you actually implement it within a, an organization it's not that scary um if you if you follow the, the steps that monica has mentioned to overcome challenges that um, the industry has experienced in the past and then jonathan has um uh, given an overview of some of the really beneficial tools that support um that process so um how you can actually put the data in and then um actually use that data as dan spoke about um earlier so like let's work smarter, not harder. Um, and it absolutely is um, time to, um, uh, to move to BIM now. So thank you everybody for attending today. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all in, uh, on your BIM journey uh, in the future. Thanks, Thanks Emily, you did a great thank job. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.